Good morning, Senator Braun, and thank you so much for being here today. It's a real pleasure to have you be our keynote speaker. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine and a pleasure to be on on a topic that uh, is dear to me, so. Excellent. Well, I'm just going to jump in with questions, if that's okay with you. Go right ahead. All right. So you've been a huge champion of healthcare reform with the focus on price transparency at the federal level for a long time. Perhaps you could share with us why you're passionate about this space. So I'll tell you what got me interested. Uh, you have to go back over a decade ago, and it would have been uh, having a small business that uh, started with like 15 employees in the early 80s and grew mostly from 98 to the present. But especially in the early 90s, uh, the healthcare benefits that I was offering seemed to be fairly routine. Uh, price increases in terms of premiums uh, were okay, but they started to turn from uh, being okay to, hey, you're lucky, it's only <laughs> going up five to 10% on renewal. I still didn't have a big check to write because I had so few employees, but you could see the handwriting on the wall. And when we grew from 15 employees in 1998, to around 300 in 2008, um, that same kind of litany uh, I heard every year upon renewal. And the only tools I could use to mitigate premium increases would be to switch underwriters every three years and raise my deductibles. And neither of which I really liked, but they were the only tools I had available. Well, we migrated from having a very low deductible to one in 2008 that had gotten up to $5,000. And that was way above what most of my other uh, fellow employers were uh, putting out there. So it got to be an issue of, in a very low unemployment area like ours, something had to change. Um, I also uh, was tired, uh, especially for the HR impact, of changing underwriters every three years. So we had a very serious conversation 12 years ago. And I said, number one, this is not gonna be a short meeting. And number two, I'm not renewing the plan as we've had it here recently. So I said, um, I've got a bunch of questions. Uh, I wanna know what I can do that's gonna change this dynamic that looks like it's not gonna change on its own. So. Uh, it got to be a little uncomfortable at first when I asked them things like, what kind of margin are you making on my plan? Uh, what is reasonable in terms of claims so that you do not say I'm lucky, it's only going up five to 10% this year. Very different kind of conversation. When we got through it, uh, I when I initiated it by saying I'm not renewing the current fully insured type plan, they informed me, well, you're just large enough to self-insure. Well, they had never told me about that in prior renewals. And I said, well, if I do that, uh, at least I'll save the profit margin. And they shook their head and that was about 25% of my plan back then. So wow, 25% savings there. And I said, what really though drives the costs of current health insurance? They said, well, there's no transparency and your employees are not engaged in their own well-being. I thought, wow, that makes perfect sense. It's paternalistic. Uh, employees up to that point were mostly interested in having no skin in the game and just wanting things to be paid for, never picking up the phone mostly back then to get a quote. Of course, the internet was uh, getting to be a handy tool as well. So I said, what else? They said, well, the biggest cost component in your insurance plan would be your co-payments. I said, tell me more. And I said, well, a low co-payment of 10 to $20, when the average item you're buying is maybe 90 to 200 bucks, who do you think's paying for it? You are with premiums that are embedded in your plan. I said, well, what would that save? That'll save you another 25%. So, wow. I had found uh, what might work. Um, getting rid of co-payments, I thought, 
that could create a, a minor revolt within the company. <laughs> and it, it did uh, create a lot of discussion because I had a young census then, uh, mostly single males that I knew in a decade would have families and this would all explode in terms of cost to them and us. But I did, at that point in time, adopted a fully consumer-driven, transparent approach to healthcare, including getting rid of co-payments. I uh, had two people quit at the time, if I remember. I had one individual that had a $200 a month medication, $10 co-payment, that was only costing 120 bucks a year, no skin in the game. He said, and he gave me the arithmetic, it's now gonna cost me $2,400. And I said, well, I'm trying to hold your premiums down in the future. And I said, by the way, have you ever bothered to shop around for your medication? Said, well, why would I with a $10 copayment? Well, you made my point. Let's see if we can find it for a better deal without going to Canada. Within 30 seconds, he gets on the internet, finds it from a reputable mail order pharmacy here in the US for 99 bucks. I said, this cannot be true that the first attempt of using transparency and shopping around, you save 50%. Well, since then, we all know colonoscopies, MRIs, CAT scans range from 700 to maybe three to 3,500. I was always wondering why the insurance companies didn't seem to push you to the less expensive option. They love high premiums. Where do why you think, do you think their they gross? Love, so why do you think they love high premiums? Because their gross revenues come from premium income. And then they try to use the tools that we can't see to beat down the providers and probably pocket a lot of the savings, some of which they pass along to uh, patients, employees, and employers, but a lot, it's that unholy alliance between insurance companies, hospitals, pharma, providers, to where we as consumers can't see anything. They sell us stuff that we hold our breath until we get our statement two months later in the mail to see if we're gonna be able to afford it. No competition. You've got barriers to entry. You've generally got an atrophied consumer, but that is starting to change with high deductible plans and the fact that people like me are not afraid to take on the powers to be, which would be pharma, hospitals, insurance, and even the AMA and uh, providers that do not embrace transparency. But it's changing a little bit. I'm hoping to cascade it into full transparency, into where they get with it, just like all other sectors of the economy do. Tell the consumer what it's gonna cost, let them choose the best option. They may be willing to pay you more if the value is there. Uh, I know what it'll do, it'll do just what it did when you save 50% on shopping around for that prescription back in 2008. That's super. So. Last summer, you had Senate Bill 1895, and when I read that bill, I was, I, I loved it. I loved all aspects of it. It had a lot of price transparency. It was giving states funding for all payer claims databases. It was asking hospitals and PBMs to be fully transparent across the board, and that was just a wonderful bill. As the months went on, uh, you know, the, the fight was on, I guess, and we didn't see anything pass last year uh, from a, a, you know, a health care bill passed last year. Um, I, I'm hoping you could kind of share with us where we are today with in regards to any health care bills. I know you sit on the, the health committee in the Senate and just kind of update everyone on, on where we're at and what you think is likely to pass this year. So that would frustrate, even depress the normal senator. Uh, I'm not the normal senator here because uh, I've been fighting the healthcare industry all along. And the reason that did not get a hearing, didn't get the first base, mm -hmm. is pharma, insurance, and hospitals, two, three, and four, or in some order, three of the four most powerful lobbies here in DC. Most Republicans are beholden to them. 
uh, gotten campaign checks from them. I don't care anything about that. Uh, they do not like me, uh, probably, because I'm trying to bust uh, the really cozy thing that they've got going for themselves. Um, and sadly, leadership uh, within both parties. Chuck Schumer um, gets an unbelievable amount of support from the Hospital Association of New York. That's why he's put cold water on many Democrats that believe in transparency, but don't want to buck leadership. Uh, the transparency bill got pulled, the, the new bill I've got out there, price, care, uh, price transparency healthcare that the White House is behind, didn't get into uh, the HEALS Act for the same reason, because there is that much clout. Then I said, well, why don't we go to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce? Uh, they are the promoters of free enterprise. And... Uh, entrepreneurs like me, people that are, want a transparent free market, they're backing the healthcare folks. So that's what I'm up against. The issue that they're gonna have to contend with is that 90% of Democrats and Republicans, healthcare consumers want more transparency. It's a house of cards that just needs to have a card or two start to go. And then I think we'll cascade it into something that might get serious. Uh, Chuck Grassley is probably the most uh, significant individual in the Senate that is not afraid to speak up on it. Uh, we did get some stuff through the Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, but it was mostly lukewarm. It started to pick up steam. Then impeachment um, came onto the scene and then COVID-19. So it's pretty well put into shambles any of the legislative agenda. And the issue, once we get COVID-19 into the rear view mirror, is how many other senators are now gonna start to embrace what I've initiated. And I think we're, I'm seeing, because I've had Democratic senators get a hold of me, where they're interested. They understand transparency will even make government paid for healthcare less expensive. It benefits, both that and the private side. And uh, believe me, I'm not gonna uh, forget what I've been talking about or lower the decimal level. I'm gonna push it even harder. Excellent. So you, you've pointed to what, what, you know, who you think are the stakeholders in healthcare that have an opportunity for improvement. It sounds like it's really full spectrum. Um, can you point to specific thoughts or ideas that you have or that are being discussed in the Senate Health Committee regarding strategies for solutions? Well, uh, you can look at the bills I've got out there, uh, but the one that is currently the centerpiece is the healthcare price transparency bill that uh, individuals like Cynthia Fisher, Heather Higgins, uh, two individuals that have been stalwarts out there uh, helping me expose what needs to be done. Uh, the other thing that you're going to find is that most CEOs who have not brought the cost of health care into the C-suite yeah. are now no longer happy with their own results. Uh, you do not have a CEO in the country that's not for doing something to change the current paradigm unless you're a CEO of a healthcare company. And sadly, that's the largest part of our economy, 20%, but that means 80% are frustrated with it. So I think you're gonna see employer associations across the country. Ironically, California's got one already, a state that normally, uh, to me, invites more government and uh, more confusion, more bureaucracy. They may be leading the way on it, but I think you're gonna see that kind of cascade through the states and you're gonna get stakeholders. Uh, the one stakeholder that I wish would be more energetic would be the healthcare consumer, him or herself. And that's because they've been coddled in a paternalistic system that everybody loves it when you make it to Medicare. Uh, even the most conservative are gonna be on record saying, thank goodness I'm on Medicare. Uh, so they look to government to again take care of their issues and 
the big risk for all of us is that this cascades into a political solution that could be as close to next year, depending on what happens in November, to where our new business partner is Bernie Sanders and not guys like me that want to fix the system and reform it, keep the best of what we got so that we don't go to a one payer system that arguably might be the only solution since every other country has had to resort to it. I think for us, we lose some of the value added that we get. Uh, my goal is to keep the best of what we got and uh, reduce it in size 30 to 40%, have the people supplying us with healthcare, embracing true free enterprise, getting the consumer engaged, just like I did 12 years ago. And I don't think I mentioned it earlier. I've not had a premium increase in 12 years and lowered family plans by 50% uh, back three, four years ago. So, so what's your uh, high deductible health plan look like now for your employees? Just curious, since uh, you mentioned some years ago it was a $5,000 out of pocket. So I've kept the lid on it, but here's what's happened since I've made them consumers, not just kind of going with the flow. They enter into their deductible less now than what they would have 12 years ago, even when they're paying for office visits and drugs. It's because they're now astute consumers. I pay 100% of wellness so that you can avoid a broken healthcare system in the first place. So I would think that most companies, even the government, because when I did it, I took the risk of co-insurance off of their shoulders. So that was a feature of my plan back in 2008. And we've had enough savings to where you are only subject to your deductible. They found ways to reduce their entry into it. And if you do get critically ill or have a bad accident, and I've been a believer, no one should go broke because of either one of those situations covered pre-existing conditions and no caps on coverage. And I've done it with a plan based upon transparency and an, and an engaged consumer and have cut costs. That sounds almost too good to be true. Well, you're doing it. And I think many employers are trying to do it and are doing it successfully. We've had some price transparency around the country with the RAND2 hospital price transparency study that came out in May of last year. Uh, right after you, we're going to have Dr. Chris Whaley present on the much-awaited RAND 3.0 results. Um, but, you know, even with the, some folks will argue um, that price transparency creates confusion and that's not what consumers need and that's not what employers need. Of course, consumers and employers, particularly employers, say we need full price transparency in order to be able to shop for care on the front end. Um, what are your comments uh, Rick, to all of the folks that say price transparency just creates more confusion in the marketplace? Don't drink that Kool-Aid. Uh, that's pharma, hospitals, insurance, and even most providers that just do not want to change the status quo because they benefited from it. And the only way you could possibly make that argument is that the consumer has atrophied to such a point that maybe they don't have the skills that they have when I'm at the grocery store and I see people pulling out their smartphones, trying to save a dollar on a $3 item. Uh, believe me, the tools and uh, the capabilities are there and people are not confused on anything else they buy. They're very certain that they want options. LASIK surgery is a great example within healthcare of where it's come down in cost by 70 to 80 percent uh, from when it first started. And you know why? No insurance involved, no middleman, the healthcare consumer and the provider. And that's the only place I hear healthcare advertise that you can get an eye done for three to 400 bucks. Uh, 
that's what it should be. That's not confusing, that's enlightening. And uh, I wouldn't fall for that argument. Well, it's interesting you say that. I've been to a radiology imaging center, an independent one, and they post their prices. I took a picture of it and you know, uh, when, when we need to go, that's where we're going because we certainly do appreciate price transparency. We have employers that are engaging now that since we've had RANT 2.0 around the country, what I see them, where I see the most action happening is in direct to a provider contracting. Uh, have you engaged with any of that or are you familiar with that particular? I am thing? familiar with that. And to me, that's the one entrepreneurial stirring that I'm seeing at the basic provider level. And uh, also, uh, I think it's great news that Walmart's putting in clinics. Uh, they are the experts at great value, low prices, and uh, spoke to uh, the individual that's in charge of that, and they intend to do that across the country. I was encouraged when Warren Buffett uh, cited healthcare as the tapeworm on our economy. That's a real graphic a way to describe it, but it's true. And then guys like Jamie Dimon at Chase Bank and Jeff Bezos at Amazon that may take healthcare reform into their own large entities. And that is all great. Um, that's shaking the system a little bit. Um, will that happen in a timely manner to where we don't start cascading to a one payer system? Um, I think it's an interesting, you know, point in time. And I think that you've got all the uh, inertia, all the wanting to preserve a broken system with the four most powerful lobbies here in DC on one side, and you've got some entrepreneurial stirrings like you just described. You get some huge corporations that are tired of paying a high healthcare bill. Uh, it'll be an interesting race to see if we fix a broken system and keep it mostly out of government's hands or whether we fail and all of us just throw our hands up in the air and say, hey, we're gonna have lower cost healthcare. We're gonna do what most other countries have had to do. And I think we'll see that we give up a few things in the process of that happening. Uh, it's all gonna play out in my opinion over the next three to five years. Love to see the industry embrace it. Quit fighting it tooth and claw. The other big issue here in DC is climate. And I was the first Republican to join the climate caucus because that is a back burner issue that will increasingly be moving to the front end of the stove. And we do not want to be caught flat footed there as well. I bring it up because the energy industry, which is a huge sector of our economy, is embracing climate discussions. How do we be part of the solution into the future? Gives me hope there. Uh, healthcare, uh, they're just fighting it uh, tooth and claw and I'm hoping that they start to lead the way. And if not, they'll pay a big political price in my mind. Yeah, you know, I will say uh, what transparency has done for us here in Indiana is we have been working with the stakeholders. We have been working with our insurers and our providers and our employers and benefit consultants, really full spectrum to sit at the same table, roll up our sleeves and figure out what each stakeholder needs to do. And I have seen steps, not from everyone um, throughout this conference, we'll hear from many of those folks. Uh, but we, we certainly do have um, some room to go, some, some room to go. So you mentioned climate, which, you know, we only have one earth, so we got to take care of it. We only have one, you know, our, one body each and we, and we need to take care of it. We can't go bankrupt um, in the process. So I, I certainly hear you on that. You mentioned value. So we define value as going to the best quality at the best cost for the purchaser. So whether that's the the, the person or the employer um, and in cost. So we say best quality at best cost and cost is just price times utilization. You know, how much does the MRI cost and how many of them are you getting? So people need to keep an eye on utilization, but we know what's really driving healthcare costs is the price. It's, it's not utilization. But can you speak a little bit to quality? You know, what, what I want to make sure that all of us 
move towards in three to five years and where we land is competition, increased competition around value, but that means best quality at best price or, or total cost of care. Any thoughts or comments about quality transparency? Yes, and that is uh, obviously part of the equation. Uh, and for the healthcare entrepreneurs that really do a great job, uh, they're gonna be able to get volume, uh, through that value equation. Uh, because when everything costs the same high price, you really don't have any way to determine uh, where that value is part of the equation. So I think that uh, there, uh, uh, the healthcare industry needs to realize that there'll be winners with transparency. Uh, you're gonna get rid of poor value, meaning, uh, so, so performance at a high price, and you're going to reward the people that give you better value, which is where they make a healthy profit margin, but use their own processes and ingenuity to do it at a lower cost. That's the hallmark of how most other sectors of the economy uh, work. So uh, that's not an easy uh, thing to probably explain in the sense that uh, if you're used to the way it is currently, but it's easy when you cite that as being the way all other markets work. And uh, especially for the people that need to start, I think, initiating. I tell the healthcare industry, when 80 senators weighed in with their idea of how to fix your industry, that is the proverbial two by four across the head that you've got something not working. And to me, the way this would cascade into something great is if the healthcare industry is doing what the energy, transportation, and the industries involved in climate are doing, looking to be part of the solution. And if not, again, I cannot overemphasize, uh, you're gonna have no one backing you. Uh, every other CEO is gonna be okay with a political solution because at least it's taking it out of their p and and they're letting that be an issue between government and the healthcare consumer. And uh, that to me is something they need to be aware of because I don't think they think that way. You know, I, I agree with you in that, you know, the definition of a fair market is that you are able to shop for care, that there's choice in the matter. And certainly there's no choice if you're getting your bill a month later after the fact. You're not making a choice based on quality or price up front. And we really need to move towards that. So that's what this conference is all about. And hopefully we'll, uh, you know, hear ideas from all, all different stakeholders about how to take steps towards that. So uh, I really appreciate your time today. Before you head off, I know you've got a committee to run to in DC. Before you run off, uh, any final words or thoughts that you'd like to leave with uh, all of the viewers today? So I love what we're doing back in Indiana. As a freshman legislator back in 2015, I introduced a kind of a mild, uh, significant, and something that would really break the system. And uh, one was just a transparency bill. Number two would be to make sure you could see the Medicare price or cost next to anything on the private side. And then part of my transparency bill currently is to expose uh, those sneaky arrangements called third party agreements between insurance companies, hospitals, pharma providers. And uh, that is all now coming to the surface at the federal level. The good news is back then I couldn't even get a committee hearing. When I left after three years, uh, I wasn't gonna run for a third term as a state legislator. I went there mostly for infrastructure. We got involved in healthcare right after I got there. Couldn't even get a committee hearing. That's how powerful the healthcare lobby was even in Indiana. I do remember the third year, the healthcare industry asked me to have a discussion with them off the record. It was in one of the basement committee buildings in the Capitol. Uh, and we had this same type of conversation. And thank goodness here in 2020, there were a few bills that made it through that are now law 
but the hard, strong arm of hospitals and the healthcare lobby kept the more significant ones from hitting pay dirt. So do not overlook what you can do back in Indiana because I'm bending the ears of state legislators for as slowly as we move here. It took 10 to 12 years to get the criminal justice reform bill done. That passed in 18, everybody was high-fiving. I was depressed when I asked him, how long you've been working on it? 10 to 12 years. Push hard, Indiana has the highest hospital costs in the country. We need transparency. We are a business-friendly state that embraces transparency and competition everywhere other than healthcare. Don't overlook what you can do there. I'm gonna certainly be talking to legislators to push the same cause in Indiana that I'm pushing here. Well, thank you, Senator Braun, for your time today. And we have folks from all over the country joining us. And it sounds like we might have to, you know, work harder at the state level um, if, if we can't quite get things done in the near term at the federal level. But thank you again for your time um, and, and all of the work that you're doing around this space. It's have my pleasure. And then for anybody listening, uh, Hoosier or otherwise, any Friday, I've had office hours offered to any Hoosier. I would even open that up to anybody interested in healthcare across the country. Come visit me in Jasper. We can spend up to an hour on talking about anything healthcare related. Uh, that's something I've offered uh, Hoosiers. I think it's important not only to Hoosiers, but to people across the country interested in it. Super. Take me up on that. Thank you. Have a nice day.